my name is Lou Harwood. Uh, this is a project I did with my good friend, uh, Andy Fisher. Um, and so real quick, the premise here is, uh, you know, so sports like uh, you know, baseball and uh, basketball, football, they have really great statistics. And for rowing, there are virtually none. Um, and so this kind of came up in conversation. Um, and we sought to bring some, uh, some sort of standard uh, to this project. So again, real quick, uh, my name is Lou. I am the CTO and co-founder at Skedaddle, which is a crowdsourced transportation platform. Uh, we had a bit of news. Beginning of this year, we helped 10,000 people to go to and from the Women's March in DC in a single weekend. Um, currently, a big thing that we have going on is Penn Station in New York is shutting down for emergency repairs, so we're helping people from towns in New Jersey get to and from the city every day on top of normal day-to-day -day business of helping people get to beaches, events, wherever they want to go. Uh, private events like weddings uh, and, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, there's a little code there for uh, $5 off your first ride. Uh, and then a little bit quick background. Andy, uh, he just recently got his PhD in biomedical engineering from BU, and he's currently a postdoc researcher there. Um, and then Andy found a picture of us around together, um, bookending the guy in the middle there. All right, so. Quickly to you know, go through the outline here, we're gonna go through why we did this project, some basic terminology on rowing, um, how we got the data, how we had to clean the data, and then finally going into the analysis of the data. All right, so uh, back in March, I was uh, doing a workout, and afterwards there happened to be a few Olympians there who were talking about the current state of US rowing, which is the national governing body for rowing. Uh, they organize the national team, all the races and whatnot. Um, and you know, the, the US rowing is having a bit of trouble with their organization and uh, retention of employees and uh, they, they were really focusing on that. And, and then at one point they started to touch upon uh, the difference in success levels between the women's and men's teams uh, at the Olympic level. And the women's team has been very dominant for the past 11 years. They've won every major regatta and the men's team has not had that same level of success. And so the, these Olympic athletes who are all domain experts were tossing around somewhat sometimes assumptions about uh, the transition rate between the under 23 national team, which is basically you know, the elite level collegiate rowing, to the senior national team and the Olympic team. Uh, and at that point I kind of stopped paying attention because I was thinking, well, you know, hold on, like, you know, does this change year to year? Does this change per country? Um, you know, how, how is this, well, what are the trends in this? And then, you know, how can we find this data? Um, and so then that led to, you know, world rowing. And it was the, you know, the whole foundation of the stock. Um, so a little bit of, let's see this. Uh, so I'm not sure, have, has anyone here tried rowing or seen rowing? I know Seattle's a big rowing area um, with, you know, University of Washington is very dominant in the sport. Uh, Boys in the Boat was written about a team, you know, from way back in the day from here. So this is a, a really great area for it. Um, uh, but in just in case you people have not heard about it, um, you know, we'll just quickly go through uh, some basic terminology here. So um, say you show up at a, a, a world's regatta. You have you know, the name of the regatta. You know, it could be the, uh, like this one right here, 2009 World Championships. Uh, there are a whole variety of races. There's men's races, women's races. There are lightweight and heavyweight. There are fours, eights, doubles, pairs, singles. And so, you know, what, are the, what do these terms mean? Uh, you see people here, they row two oars. Some people row with one oar. Some people have a coxswain steering the boat. And the boats without a coxswain, uh, if they have multiple people in it, there's actually the, the rudder is attached to someone's foot. And so they have to steer with their foot as they're paying attention, going as hard as they can yeah, backwards. So um, you know, there's, there's a whole variety of different skills going on here. Um, so I'm just going to you know, quickly use some, some data um, that we'll, we'll talk about how we got uh, later on. But just to quickly go through the boat class column here, we see there's all these different ways to describe the boat. Um, but some basic patterns we can see here are, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it could start off with a B, like so, and then we'll go through Rosier's example. Um, so B, M, 4, X. So what is that saying is, you know, the, the B signifies this is a E23 event. Um, so there's a couple others like that, uh, row 13 and 14. Um, so that's a E23 event. You know, uh, you know, everyone's under 23 years old, you know, obviously. Um, so the M for men, and then 4X, you know, there are four rowers and there's a sculling boat. So each rower has two oars. 
Um, below that, you know, M2 plus. You know, it's again a men's boat. There are two rowers, and the plus signifies that there's a coxswain steering the boat. A minus would say, you know, say it's a straight boat, there's no coxswain. One of the rowers has a rudder attached to their foot. Um, and so then if we go down the list, you know, J, W, 4 minus, it's a junior women's uh, straight four. So there's no coxswain, it's a junior women's boat. So everyone's under 19. Um, so pretty straightforward. You know, there's, uh, as we get into Paralympics, there's some, uh, some other letters that, that get added. Um, and so it gets a little more complicated with that, but for the focus of this talk, we, we decided to stick with just uh, uh, world's racing, uh, Olympic racing, under 23 and junior. Um, again, just to quickly show, um, you know, so there's, so again, helper columns here, but uh, yeah, like what, what kind of data we're looking at. So, you know, we show up the regatta, it takes place in, uh, you know, uh, we, we can see what city and country it is, uh, what the name is, what year it is, um, not too much else going on there. It's pretty straightforward. And the races, I mean, there's, it, you know, there's a bunch of boats that are entered. So there could be heats and finals, there could be semifinals, quarterfinals, seating races. Um, so we had to go through and clean all this data to uh, bring some, some uh, standards here. So just to sum all that back up, there's sculling and sweep, which really just says how many oars does each rower have. Uh, the plus and minus says there is a coxswain or not. Um, and then you can see you know, in the in sculling boats, you, know, you, you can have you know, the one X, you know, one, one person, you can't obviously have one oar with one person that just go in circles, but then you know, the rest of it is fairly straightforward. And then you know, in front of that, there may be you know, an M or a W based on men or women, um, and then you know, a B, a J. Um, if it's a lightweight event, there's an L. Um, so not, not too complicated, but just to really hammer that home so we can understand that moving forward. Um, one last time going through. So men, women, open, uh, lightweight, open weight. Um, so we've already discussed that a bunch. Then there's heat repechage, quarterfinal, semifinal, and then there's a whole list of finals. And if it's a big event, say for example, the single, uh, you know, the men's or women's single at the Olympics, there could be a huge number of entries. And so there could be the seeding of race, and then the quarterfinal, and then the semifinal. And then you have repechages if someone doesn't do well in a heap, but then they have a second chance to make it to the semifinal. And so there's a, a path that isn't always straightforward to make it to a, a final. All right, so now we get into data collection. Um, you know, most of these libraries I think everyone's used. Uh, I'm not sure, has, has any, everyone here used Network X before uh, for graphing? Uh, so that was my first time using it was this project, and it was actually really cool. I really enjoyed using that. And then uh, we just did some Venn diagram stuff with Matplotlib. Um, so we can see these are really standard uh, URLs. Uh, when you browse the page on uh, your web browser, uh, it goes and it appends the name of the person at, for, at the end. But we can take that off, and we still get the same results. So now we can loop through. Uh, take that number out, 8639, and we can just loop through until we're, we're, we stop seeing people show up, basically. We, we just loop through this until uh, we 404 a bunch of times and we know that there's no longer any data. Uh, the, the trouble we ran into as we started digging into this is that uh, there are pockets and sections of missing IDs, and so if you see 10 missing IDs in a row, or 30 or 40, that doesn't mean that it's ended. Uh, so we, we saw that 50,000 was a good number to go to, and so we went to 50,000. Um, and then, you know, towards the end there, there were more and more missing IDs, but you know, there'd still be the occasional uh, athlete showing up. So we had to account for all that. Uh, so the web page is broken down into two important sections. The first one is like right here, the athlete bio has important information. What's the name, gender, birth date, height, weight? Um, a few other things that we collected just to you know see if that would be useful. Um, nothing too nothing too crazy here. This is where it really gets interesting though, because uh, each athlete has their own page of this information. So now we have to make sense of thousands of these pages and tie it all together and say who is rowing with who, um, at which race, how do they do, how do they, what's the final rank, who is more successful, and so that's where this started to get a little more complicated. Um, so. Quickly running through terminology, we can see here's the regatta, uh, here's each individual race, and then we go through, okay, so there's a boat class, country, here's you know, the, the final semifinal heat, uh, the rank, and then final time. Um, 
scraped the athlete data. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we saw some problems with uh, grabbing HTML tags that could say, uh, you know, uh, year or, or uh, you know, birth year, birth date, and then they'd put, you know, the city there occasionally. So there's no standard whatsoever to how World Rowing stored the data. And so at times that was frustrating, but we uh, pushed through it. Um, again, we already saw this, but just to you know, review the schema once more. Uh, get the athletes, get the race, get athlete races to tie those two together, and then you get the regatta. So now we can say which athlete was at which regatta. Um, real simple, we just loop through the few functions we, we uh, hacked together uh, 50,000 times to grab all the athlete ID, all the regatta, race ID information, um, apologize for the block of text. I, uh, I should have broken this down, especially since we just went through a whole thing on data cleanliness in, you know, in here. Um, so this is, I mean, this is really basic. You can see line 27, grab the URL, and certain ID in there each time. If it doesn't return a 404, uh, grab all the information you possibly can from the bio. And at the time, we weren't really sure because no one was defining this project other than us. You know, what type of data do we want to collect? You know, we may be useful later. Um, so that was, that was pretty straightforward. Again, so uh, regattas, once we grabbed the athlete, we say, okay, uh, luckily the regatta and race info was all in an HTML table, so we could say which regattas were on the page, and then within that, which races did the athlete uh, compete in at that regatta. Um, and so that's where this really gets interesting, is now we have to say, okay, we have this regatta. Luckily, all the regattas were in the uh, same format listed, um, even if the names, the name conventions changed over time. So we could say, did we, have we already seen this regatta? Um, you know, if yes, we get the ID. If no, uh, yeah, we add it. Um, so really straightforward there. Same thing with the races. We say, this athlete did this race. Have we seen this race before? Uh, yes, grab the ID. No, add it to the table. And then we, you know, athlete races, we say, grab that ID. Um, grab the athlete ID and create a record. All right, so data cleaning. Uh, so this is really where, I mean, so if you look at Athlete ID 1, uh, this is where my optimism died. So they were born in 1985, and their first race is 1978, and this is really common for this whole database. It just, uh, it, it just didn't stop. And, like, um, and, uh, I don't know. I mean, we, uh, I mean, hopefully by the end of this we can work, work with world rolling, and maybe we can, you know, uh, you know, point out some areas for improvement at the end. But this was definitely a struggle for us for quite a while, uh, was cleaning the data and seeing how we can improve it. Um, we wanted to standardize all the names. So you can see here in that first method, um, you know, we worked with uh, one of the Olympians I originally mentioned uh, in the uh, beginning there as a domain expert. Um, so that's how we know that Nations Cup is actually E23 regatta, but then the other ones, uh, they all virtually say the same thing, but we wanted a, a column just to make sense of that, uh, just so we didn't have to think about that later. Um, World Championships stayed the same throughout. Uh, the rest of them, uh, there tends to be uh, World Run Cups all had the same format, but they're just having to be multiple through each season. Usually it's three. Uh, I think the highest it got there was six. Um, so yeah, you know, that, that was pretty standard as well. Um, they got a little more complicated, not complicated, just uh, tedious with the, the semifinals. There's uh, some naming differences there. Um, you can see in my comments here, I, I saw digging through data that the, the, the finals weren't always listed as final A is the A final. So if there's only one final, uh, once we saw that it was listed as F final and that really uh, was you know more distrust of the data. So. Um, just going through, really, you know, simple. Just adding a column, saying is this a heat, semifinal, final, uh, a couple others. Uh, so then breaking this down. So we have a just helper functions we had to at the uh, every time we started this project up and we wanted to you know uh, explore and, and test the new things. We said okay, just run this function. Well, we had in a separate uh, file altogether, and we'd say load in the data frames. Uh, you know, my my fault when I scraped, I accidentally added. Ex uh, extra columns, um, and then apply these helper functions. And so now it's just really straightforward, plug and play, um, what's going on, okay, like, you know, so this last one I didn't show you, but, you know, is this a sculling event, does this boat have a coxswain, what are the number of rowers here? So just further cleaning the data and providing a standard. All right, uh, so 
this is where we start to, to look at the data and we were saying, okay, well, you know, like what, what can we make sense of here? And we still don't know what is good data or bad data. We're still plugging through and, and working through that. And so you see things like this and you wonder um, you know, what happened in 1984. Uh, but you know, I, I think part of it is uh, the, the URL here, um, you know, worldrowing.com, it, you know, they didn't really come about until the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And so they're backfilling data before that. So I, they may have just used a filler. Um, you know, so we're still exploring the how and the why there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, um, that was definitely an interesting graph to pull through. And then the other thing we see here is, you know, the, the increase in the uh, number of women over time. Um, some things you know uh, that really pull through with that. You know, so Title IX um, really uh, you know allowing uh, women to compete at a collegiate level um, that really improved the quality of the sport, uh, especially in the U.S. Now that the uh, you know, the uh, U.S. women are very dominant, and uh, I mean every one of them. I've heard lots of people say it's, you know Title IX has shown uh, its its strength. Um, so you know, just more data here. You know how. Uh, you know, the heights, again, this is all fairly standard, except you can kind of see at the bookends that we, there are some ridiculous heights here. So we, we counted a number of athletes above three meters were 87, and a number of athletes shorter than one meter were 13. Um, so, I mean, that's, this is wrong. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, we're still making sense of, of what data to trust. I mean, I think, we saw that maybe the athlete bio information was bad, but the, you know, the boat itself, uh, the athlete and you know, the races they participated in was good. So we were trying to, we're still trying to push our way through all that. Um, so it, we're, we're getting there. It's the, uh, we're really just scratching the surface with what we can do to analyze this data. Um, again, you know, rower heights um, or size over time. Um, what we saw is you know, as we get into the early 2000s, there's a dip. And actually what that is is, you know, the, there's uh, mainly junior athletes at that age um, who are, you know, coming onto this website uh, at the first, as, you know, the first time, um, and yet yeah, they're still growing. I mean, they're still, they're not, the, you know, they're not super old yet. So they, uh, you know, they, they, they're not at full height all the time. So, you know, we can see that that dip right there. Um, so. But the, and the, you know, here's really a, a, you know, what we what we wanted to find out. Um, and you know, quick note, and this is a matplotlibven, uh, pretty cool package and really easy to use. Uh, but yeah, we just uh, counted up the number of athletes and saying, okay, uh, can we see trends with this data? Well, we can see, uh, you know, being a junior athlete, uh, you know, across the board doesn't have a bearing on making it to the Olympics. Um, you know, there's a lot of other factors that go into play with that. I mean, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you know, try, but, uh, you know, it just, we, that, that was you know, the first thing we saw. I mean, we broke it down uh, by country and by uh, success level um, further down, uh, but we wanted to see, okay, you know, like, if you, if you were in you know, one uh, group, you know, did that have an effect necessarily in being in another group? And so, and we also looked at, you know, yes, you know, so their Olympics happen once every four years, and there's plenty of other athletes who, race at World Cups only, or World Cups, World Championships. So you can be a senior athlete and not make it to the Olympics. And you know, so we didn't account for that in this diagram, but um, I believe in this table we did, yeah. Uh, you know, so the count of athletes who did you know, Worlds and the Olympics, you know, 3,300. So, um, so yeah, that, that does have an effect. Um, you know, that, that, uh, the graph would be a, a little bit different but uh, you know, still being a junior rower didn't have a uh, major effect on you know, whether you make it to the senior team or not. I mean, you know, you, uh, rowing at a U23 level had a greater effect on making it to the, uh, the world's level, the senior level though. So that was interesting. Uh, but you know, again, you know, like you're, uh, these athletes tend to be more fully developed at uh, college age. And this is a sport where uh, you're just spending hours and hours doing volume training. Um, at the Olympic level, I, they're spending uh, you know, six or seven hours a day training, and then the race itself at the final is around six minutes. So, I mean, over the course of four years, they could be spending dozens of hours for every stroke of that final race, just training away. Um, and so it's a really brutal sport given how much uh, 
time you put in for the final race. Uh, so further analysis here, um, you know, this is something we got to look into as well is, uh, so the number of Olympians for the US is significantly higher than the other countries. Um, yeah, we're inclined to think that it's not, um, you know, that it may not be true. I mean, we want to you know, take a look at, okay, so uh, we need to do an analysis of which boats competed at these events, and then you know, take, as opposed to looking at this from the athlete level, take a look from the, the, the boat level and say which boats competed at these events because there are, are uh, instances where the, the boat may have missing athletes. Um, they just may be missing data. So we, uh, we need to account for this. Um, so I mean, you can see, I mean, the, the biggest part of this whole project was data collection and data cleaning. And you know, we've just been digging further and further into the, the analysis section here, but um, you know, it's definitely exciting to, to see uh, the numbers pull through. And we'd, we, yeah, we'd, again, we'd really like to work with worldrowing.com to, to clean this data up, uh, and then from there do further analysis. They have sections on their pages for uh, speed and, and uh, you know, the stroke rate data, so how fast the boats are moving and uh, how many strokes per minute they're, they're rowing at. So. Uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to see changes and trends in that over time as well. But first, we wanted to really hammer through this. Um, so, to quickly sum this up, we see that there's a huge uh, difference between the number of Olympians in the USA versus everywhere else. Um, and then we try to look at that trend again for male versus female. Again, uh, number one, both male and female, but then uh, number of Olympians with junior experience, you know, we dropped down. So, um, we need to inspect the quality of the data first, but you know, for the athlete count. But it is interesting that even though the athlete count is so much higher for number of Olympians in the U.S., that the uh, the U.S. is much lower in uh, number of athletes that convert from junior to senior team. And so that's the question. That, you know, so maybe these athletes burn out. Um, you know, I personally have had several friends who completely burnt out because they just overtrained when they were a teenager and you know, hated it. Um, so, you know that that you know that could be a factor. Um, it, you know, it really there's a, there's a whole lot going on here. Uh, I know from people telling me that you know that other countries tend to pay their athletes more, whereas in the U.S. they make you know under ten thousand dollars a year, and you know they some of these people went to Ivy League schools and they need to get a job. Um, so it it really depends on um, you know a few factors there of why they didn't make it from the junior team to the, the senior team. Um, yeah, again, we, we kind of take a look here. Uh, so junior experience, did it have an effect on uh, top Olympic gate boats? Um, just the Olympic gate, not you know, any of the other boat classes. Um, and we see, I mean, not really. Um, you know, it's kind of all over the place here. There's no distribution. There's no, uh, not like, necessarily trend there. Um, so, it, uh, I mean, we'll look at the next slide as well. You can see this is just quickly U23. Uh, so you can see roughly they're about the same. Um, you know, there's no necessarily trend here. It's just, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we, uh, yeah it, the, there's always an asterisk with this. You know, we need to figure out why uh, uh, the data isn't standard in certain areas before we make final assumptions here of why uh, the data looks a certain way. So, uh, you, know, there, you know, given the data we, ha we were given, we didn't see that rowing at a certain level as a young kid or at a, at a collegiate level uh, meant that you'd be an Olympic champion. Um, so this is, you know, this is really another area of interest uh, that we just started to stumble upon last week. Um, we wanted to see uh, basically, just building a graph. Um, this is where Network X comes into play. As a, um, you know, could we could we see who's rowed with who in the, in which boats? Um, can we see over time if we add uh, weights to these edges? Um, you know, how successful certain combinations were. Uh, you know, could we see you know these these two or three people were far more successful than than the others? Um, and that's a tough problem because you don't necessarily know 
what other countries are doing and to prioritize their votes. And so now you have this, this uh, you know, task where you have to say, I need to maximize uh, you know, these votes in this order, and I, don't, I have no idea what order the other teams are prioritizing their votes. And so that could work out in your favor, may not. Um, but you know, we, we just starting to really scratch the surface on this uh, in the past few days here. Um, you know, just I'll, I'll start getting into the graphs. Uh, you know, so the, uh, this intuitively this makes sense. I mean, you know, people who rode uh, in the women's eight uh, when it first became an event um, and no longer row in that boat. And so you can see over time, you know, if we start at one section of the graph, uh, people row with each other, and then yeah, some people tire, new people join in the boat, and that continues to happen over time. And then you get to the current athletes. Um, and so this, you know, this one, you know, made sense to me. It was actually uh, the men's graph, which I thought was surprising. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, disconnected uh, segments here, uh, and, and I guess you know the you know the, the people rode together as an eight, and then they stop. Um, occasionally, there was some connectivity going on. Um, you still do get a cluster, and I believe that is uh, more recent athletes. So. Uh, what's going on with the athletes uh, from some period of time ago? Why did they row just once? You know, so we need to inspect that. And so this may help us uh, figure out what's going on here with the data. Uh, why are some athletes only listening here once? Is it just uh, an error? Uh, you know, is there a mistake? Are there missing athletes? Uh, you know, that could have connected this graph even more. Um, so what, you know, how, you know we're, we're taking a look at this and saying, you know, how can we uh, really dive in here and uh, see what's going on. And the other thing to note, if you know, go back, I mean, this is a much newer event for the women uh, compared to the men. So the, 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 these athletes in this database are, are very old, and um, you know, it's no fault of, of worldrowing.com. And they may have just, it may be really difficult to get that data now. Um, you, know, you know, not know in a non-Olympic year uh, what what they were doing. You know, who who was in the boat. You have an old picture, and you have to you get the guess. Um, you, you maybe try to dig in and call someone, but that's still difficult. Um, and so again, you know uh, the you know, the uh, GBR. So Great Britain, um, very similar. Uh, you know, uh, this more more dis this one's a little more connected uh, for men, and then the women. It's a similar thing where it's uh, um, you know kind of a semicircle. Um, and then I think I had one more team in here. Yeah. Canada. Um, so again, you see for the men a cluster, and then you see some sections around the edge where uh, they you know, rode once uh, as a group, and that was it. Um, the women's graph for Canada is interesting. You see there's one uh, node that is connected and has many, many edges. Um, so we, you know, we couldn't get uh, the data for who the coxswain was in this. You know, we'd have to the data was available. If we go way back to the beginning uh, on that regatta page, you see that there was a link. You could see the boat lineup, but that was uh, that was opening up a whole other can of worms of going to a separate page on that website and trying to deal with that data as well. And we just said that yeah, it's not worth it. Um, so that could be a coxswain who was rowing for quite a while. Uh, I mean, it's not nearly as much of a physical, uh, physical toll on the body to sit in the boat and um, and steer and uh, coach them through a race. Uh, I mean, it's still taxing to, to squeeze into that seat and um, you know, as the boat, as the oars uh, you know, enter the water and the, the rowers all they go all the way um, back up to the front of the slide to put the uh, blade in, sometimes there can be a stop and go. And so that can be jarring on their back. And so that over time it is physically demanding for coxswains as well, but uh, um, it is uh, not, not at the same level. So it could have been that you know, it could have been that uh, we haven't built this out yet enough to really dr like, drill into, um, you know, who has the most edges, and you know, who, uh, you know like really analyzing these graphs. You know, you know, we uh, and we built these in the past couple of days, and we were just trying to see what we could find here. Um, and there's so much more we can do with this. There's so much more we can do with, you know, the other sections. I'm sure in the data science conference, everyone's thinking, "Oh my God, like why didn't we do that?" Uh, like there's there's just so much we can do with this, and we're really looking forward to it. And you know, the tough part is, uh, you know, this is not this has nothing to do with my day job. This has nothing to do with his day job. So uh, we work on nights and weekends whenever we're both around, and so that's just you know, um, we're we're having fun with it uh, and exploring whatever we can. But. Um, you know, so you know, onto that. You know, what are the next steps here? I mean, we want to see retention rates of athletes, uh, junior U23 development, and really drill into that. 
uh, as I said before, examine, you know, not from just from the athlete level, from, you know, the boat level, okay? So uh, find all the boats that have missing athletes. Uh, I know, I, I mean, I've seen that that exists. Uh, we just haven't had time to, to examine that yet. And that's, uh, I think that would be very telling is seeing which, you know, does that vary by country? Uh, which, which teams have missing athletes or is it, you know, more, uh, you know, older races that we're just missing data? Um, so I think that that's something to examine as well. You know, how does that affect the data we're looking at? I mean, would it be easier for us just to say everything from 1999 earlier is just out? And we just say it's not useful to us. Um, and we want to examine modern day rowing with you know, the newest blades and the newer technology. Is that what we want to examine? Or are we trying to examine the entire data set? We initially want to do the entire data set, but uh, we've tossed around the idea of throwing out you know, a good portion of the data just to and, you know, enforce a, a standard here. Um, and as you guys can see from my scraping code, the scraping process has to improve. Um, we need something that's easily repeatable and probably stored in a database since this is re relational data. Um, just getting some basic feature engineering going is another big thing. Uh, and then, you know, the last part, uh, I thought this was interesting because it actually was what started the, the whole network analysis here is, uh, you know, I, I, I was sitting with the, or with the demand expert um, and uh, you know, I was saying, oh, it'd be cool to see like you know who and which boat uh, is they are, you know the, the the power player or the power subgroups. And uh, I mean, she was saying, oh yeah, that'd be you know that's cool, but it'd be, it'd be so hard to, to to see that because you have no idea what's going on with the other team, and maybe they didn't put their best athletes in that boat. Um, you know, people you know, the teams reprioritize what their their top boat is, and that changes things around quite a bit. Um, and so then you know, as we think about that, you know, one thing to think about if you guys have read Boys in the Boat. Uh, you know, they go quite in depth in that book about how uh, it's not just about the, putting the strongest people in the boat, but the people who row best together in the boat. And so you can get more data on you know, who has the best scores in the rowing machine, but that doesn't always equate to who is the best in the water. Um, this is a sport where you have to put the blade in and this coach is counting the number of frames on the camera, how fast you do that, and at the same time as everyone else. And then pushing forward, you know, you know, you're really driving your legs down and just levering the boat, bending the oar, and launching it forward. And so doing that completely in harmony is, uh, is very difficult, and that's why they, these athletes spend so many hours training to do that. Um, and so that's something this book touches upon. You know, but we're saying, how can we measure this? Uh, you know, is that something where we can say, okay, we built some sort of ranking system with this graph, and we say, you know, here are the most successful athletes in this eight. And so uh, we can you know, do, you know, uh, make an assumption about how uh, maybe maybe they're, they're the better athletes in the eight, and so then we stumbled upon this thing, um, you know, called a weighted synergy graph, and this was actually done in 2013, and some follow-up work was done in 2015. But basically, it's saying, okay, uh, the, the strength of the team is not just the sum of the individual components, but the, you know, the, uh, how well they work together. And this was originally done with robots, um, you know, specifically about uh, urban disaster recovery. But uh, you know, they they mention in there that. It could easily uh, be um, you know, extrapolated to teams, you know, in, in human tasks. And then, you know, someone did follow up work about that with NBA teams, and they said uh, examining zero sum games where you know there's a winner and a loser, uh, and both teams are trying to put their best uh, five men or women out there. Uh, how does you know this team? Who who are the best? Given that they're also trying to find their best, and so that was you know it's something we're, we're digging into now is how can we apply this to um, you know a six boat race. Where, you know, where everyone's trying to do the same thing and everyone's trying to put their best people forward and, and who are those best people. All right, and, uh, and that is it. Uh, any questions? Questions? Yeah, I'll ask. So you said you, you, that cleaning the data was a real challenge and most of the work. Yeah. So what did you learn or what kinds of lessons are there about cleaning data that could be applied? Uh, patience. To other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any techniques, technologies, uh, rules of thumb? So I use uh, Beautiful Soup and requests to get the data. Uh, and then from there, it was, uh, I mean, uh, there, there, there's probably a better way, but I mean, I, because I was scraping, 50,000 athletes, and I threw this up on an EC2 server where I'd start the job before work, 
and I would see if it was done after work. That means you know, there was a good chunk of time where it could break. And so what I would do is I would, uh, you know, every 500 lines or so uh, of, of processing, I'd just create an output saying, all right, you know, here's where I'm at. Uh, and then anytime I hit a 404, I'd log that to this status file. And so uh, I used, uh, I, I, people here are probably familiar with Tmux, so I just, you know, go on EC2, uh, go, you know, start that in a Tmux session, log off, go to work. On my lunch break, I can log in, see what line it's at in this status.txt file. I just, you know, cat the file, see what you know, the last line is. Uh, is it still working or whatnot? And that way, and then periodically I would save the data. Uh, and then that way I knew if something broke halfway through the day, I'd have a starting point again. I could just say, okay, load this data and then continue forward. One thing I really, uh, it got me twice before I caught it, uh, it just in different uh, sections, was um, special characters. You know, if you have a race somewhere in Europe or Asia, I mean, there could be special characters in the names of you know the athletes or in the names of where the country is, uh, and so uh, catching that and uh, using I think I did UTF I think is what handles that. Yeah, so I uh, just making sure anytime I grab data, I convert it right away before I saved it, and that way it didn't break. Just things like that. Uh, it was really just one at a time. Just you know, okay, I hit this problem. Okay, fix it. Now I hit this problem, and but. Uh, you know, trying to patch it and then looking over else, where, where's this, where's this bug? Can I find it again? But uh, giving myself out, you know, status output and uh, saving whenever possible really helped a lot. Any other questions? All right, one quick update. Um, in addition to there being uh, snacks outside, uh, there's going to be a lightning talk sign-up sheet. You can go sign up if you want to give a quick five-minute talk. The, uh, the, the pod data uh, crew will go through that and will, people will let you know really quickly. Just make sure you put, your, make sure you put a, an email address that you will check uh, down in the list. Otherwise, Lou, thank you for a great presentation. Yeah. Thank you.